Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to invite everybody and welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for tonight's uh, panel discussion about the Arab Awakening. We've got a great panel tonight, and it's going to be moderated by Harvard Kennedy School professor Nick Burns. So enjoy the forum. Nick. Trey, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see everyone here. I'm Nick Burns. I'm pleased to be your moderator for this evening. We have an all-star cast to discuss, I think, the major international event of 2011. I guess I should say, after the economic collapse, is the Arab Awakening, the revolutions in the Arab world that began in Tunisia in mid-January uh, that continue today. One of the questions we'll look at is, how long-lasting is it? And we have assembled here four distinguished experts from the Arab world who will help, her, help us decipher this issue and talk about its intricacies. And I'll begin with Sultan, Sultan al Qasimi, who is to my left, who is a UAE-based journalist and columnist, an expert on Arab politics and economics. Um, Karim Makdizi, who is the associate director of the Islam Faris Institute at the American University of Beirut, an associate professor there of international politics and environmental policy. Diana Butu who was the spokesperson for the Palestinian Liberation Organization. She was the legal advisor to the Palestinian delegation at recent Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And we're very fortunate, is a fellow at the Kennedy School and Harvard Law School this year. She's come back after having been with us last year. We're delighted that Diana is back. She's speaking on Thursday at noon about the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations and about this prominent issue of the Palestinians, the General Assembly at the United Nations. And finally, Rahmi Huri, Huri, who is no stranger to the Kennedy School, who is director of the Islam Faris Institute at AUB, the American University of Beirut. He's editor at large of the Daily Star. He's a journalist as well. He has been a fellow here. He is a fellow here at the Kennedy School. And he is a fervent, devoted admirer of the Syracuse University Orange basketball and football. <laughs> Ask him about that. He'll be delighted. <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> We wanted to open the questioning by examining what we call this conflict. Because here in the United States, nine times out of 10, if you read our press, it's called the Arab Spring. I personally believe it's misnamed. That there's got to be something more true to describe in depth what's happening in the Arab world. And I want to start maybe, Dana, with you. Do you agree it should be called the Arab Spring, or what would you call this? I call it the Arab uh, uprisings or intifadas. Uh, taking after the Palestinian Intifada, the first one that began in, in late, uh, the late 80s, 1987, and the second one, 2000. And the reason I call it that is because I don't think that it's just a, a, a temporal uh, uh, series of uprisings. I think it's uh, much, much, it's going to be a long struggle. And uh, I think it's not just confined to, to either a, a period or just to um, certain issues. So I think that there's something that's broader in scope that, in, that involves uh, actually uh, ta taking on and rising up against the current status quo, not just in the realm of economics or politics, but in the broader area of the Arab world. Kareem, what do you think? Do you agree with Diana? Yes, Arab I, uprising, intifada. Yes, I, I agree wholly. I think we were talking about this beforehand, before the panel, and we agreed it's not an Arab Spring, and that the uprisings or intifadas would probably be the most uh, apt description. I wouldn't upgrade it to revolutions yet, necessarily, depending on what happens in the longer term. I think revolution uh, is, a, is a term, at least academically, that's, that needs to be developed a little bit more before we can figure out if it's an actual revolution, what's going to change structurally, economically, socially, what's going to change. But I agree that uprisings, especially linking to the roots, which is the Palestinian uprisings, I think is a very important issue. Thank you. I interviewed Nabil Fahmi who was the former Egyptian ambassador to the United States, now at the American University in Cairo. And it was a public interview recorded, so I can quote him. And he said, we can't call it the Arab Spring for two reasons. One is, there's no summer in the Arab world, he said. But, but more importantly, he said, it's not like the Prague Spring. It's not going to be extinguished by some foreign force or even internal force. He thought it was long lasting. Sultan, do you agree with that? Um, I always believe that the, um, the Arab awakenings or the Arab uprisings will probably last maybe for a decade. We're, we're looking at a, uh, at a major um, you know, tsunami of, um, of change that will take place um, in, in every country in a different way, but ultimately uh, the Arab world will never be the same. Rahmi, do you agree with the group? 
I agree with all of those comments. I, if I were to use one phrase, I would call it this Arab revolt or the citizen revolt, because it captures the idea that what you have here is people who want to be citizens, who want to have rights, who want to live under constitutional frameworks, who want to live under systems of governance in which the consent of the governed matters, uh, and in which they have a say. And remember that this is a, a long-term process, as Sultan is saying. The American uprising that began in 1775 uh, required a civil war and, and several centuries uh, until a woman got the vote and then African Americans got the vote. So it took you a long time in this country to complete uh, the citizenship rights and the equality rights of your uprising in the, in the late 18th century. So I think we're, we're looking at a process of several decades at least, but this is a, a, an awakening, a revolt that is rigoring the entire mechanism of the exercise of power. Let's go to this a little bit into a little bit deep, uh, deeper detail. The four of you seem to be saying that we are looking then at a profoundly important historical event. That in 22 Arab countries, something has been unleashed: pent up frustration, an urge for reform, governments overthrown in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, the leader overthrown for all intents and purposes in Yemen, and government under threat, certainly in Syria and reform movements in every other Arab country, including Sultan in the countries where you come from, even in the Gulf. So are we looking at perhaps the most important event in the Arab world in a generation or two? Is it that, is, is reform and the deep-seated interest in it that important? I would say that this is the most significant development since the birth of the modern Arab state system about 100 years ago. This is the first time that you have had across this region a process of national self-determination created at the hands of empowered citizens who are demanding that they have the right to, uh, to f f form policy, define their government system, define their national values, define everything that goes into creating a sustainable modern uh, state, except for the borders, which probably won't change very much for, uh, for now. So I think this is absolutely the most important development since the birth of the modern Arab state system. And Kareem, I know um, I want to get you in here. Um, we titled this session The Arab Awakening mm -hmm. after the George Antonius book mm -hmm. that described the first Arab Awakening as the Arab peoples overthrew the Ottoman Empire and British and French influence. You agree with Rami in that respect? Yes, I was just going to bring this up. I think, um, obviously, I agree that this is a seminal event and it's going, the repercussions are going to be for decades to come. But I, I, would, I think it's very important to, to realize that this is not, didn't come spontaneously. This has been building up historically throughout the 20th century. It's not, uh, at the beginning when these were happening, people were calling it the Twitter revolutions and all these things, as though somehow if it weren't for Twitter, there would not be uprisings, there would not be something happening here. Uh, you know, a, a quick look at history shows us that in 1919 there were uprisings, in the 1920s, 1930s in Palestine there were uprisings, uh, there was Abdel Nasser periods in the 50s and 60s, decolonization. There's been social movements and political movements and uprisings throughout the 20th century, perhaps not so last couple of decades, except in, in Palestine and in Lebanon, partially. Uh, but that's because of the kind of the configuration over the past two, three decades of these regimes that have just spurted roots and that have became very, very difficult. And they were internationally backed, and that's a key issue. But it is important to contextualize it and to historicize it and to say, this is not spontaneous. It's not one day they woke up and you know, here it is but has rooted in a long history of, of rebellion and, and the need to, to want to improve, like everywhere else in the world, of course. Um, if I may, okay. it's important to cite uh, the, the series of studies that was um, authored by a group uh, headed by Dr. Reem uh, Khalaf, uh, the uh, Arab Human Development Report, written over three, four years from about a decade ago, warning of a democracy deficit, a women's rights deficit, a freedom deficit in the Arab world, a lack of economic development. In fact, one of the authors of the, of the, of the uh, series found that the Arab economies actually uh, sh shrank between 1971 and 2001. There was a 2.8% uh, negative growth in the, in the Arab world. And, and, and you couple that with, in a, in a region of 300 million, you have 75% under 29, unemployment of 25%. Unfortunately, some places don't consider women unemployment as unemployment. Um, so, uh, you know, all these factors coming together uh, along with the, the lack of any political rights, really laid the foundation. Dan, I want to talk, start talking about some of the specific countries that are affected here. I mean, one is, of course, Palestine, 
Um, what impact do you think the Arab revolt, the Arab uprising, is going to have on the Palestinian people in both the West Bank and in Gaza? And will it have an impact, positive or negative, on your potential negotiations with the Israelis? Just to build on the previous question, um, while all of the factors that Sultan uh, laid out were definitely factors in leading to uh, these series of uprisings, there was one factor that I think people really haven't focused on, and that is the ongoing repression that existed in the Arab world uh, at, because of Israel, at the behest of Israel. That the, the Americans, for example, were looking towards um, Israeli pu public opinion and Israeli popular opinion and ignoring the popular opinion of and public opinion of the rest of the Arab world, including the Palestinians. And so I think that there was, uh, there's definitely a link between what, um, what is happening with these uprisings and what's going on in Palestine. Now, what's more interesting is that since the, the uprisings have taken off, um, we haven't seen yet that uprising take shape in Palestine. That isn't to say that they haven't been affected by it. The, the leadership definitely has been. Uh, everything from the prime minister resigning and trying to form a new cabinet to Hamas and Fatah uh, coming together in a reconciliation agreement. It's as though they're, they're hearing and feeling the effects of the, of the Arab uprisings, but they haven't yet managed to uh, figure out what to do next. And this ties in, into large part in terms of what's going to happen next vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Palestine. Is there going to be a sea change uh, with regard to the way the United States views the issue of Palestine, or is it going to be business as usual? Okay. Rami? I think the uh, resonance of the Palestine issue across the region has to be measured in many different ways. And this is an area where people in the Arab world clearly feel it, understand it, they live it. Um, they watch it on TV, they see what is happening to Palestinians, occupation, subjugation, siege, uh, arrest, uh, killings, etc. Uh, in, in an active war between Israelis and Palestinians, they see this and they don't like it, but there are other repercussions of the Arab-Israeli conflict which have to be measured in decades of Arab security states being uh, uh, anchored in this region to control public opinion uh, at the behest of Western powers and uh, Israel primarily, uh, and their own regimes that want to keep this place, this region, completely pacified. And therefore, you ended up with 250, 300 million Arab nationals who had no citizenship rights, who had no possibility to, uh, to behave like citizens. And they blame this partly on the repercussions of the Arab-Israeli conflict. So you need to understand the Arab-Israeli conflict and the role of Palestinian rights in the Arab world beyond just what Israel does to the Palestinians. It's also what, how this plays itself out in denying Arab rights in the name of security. This is one of the reasons people have revolted, and it is becoming more clear now, months later, in Egypt. You're starting to see in Egypt a very clear manifestation of what I think I said here on this stage in February when we talked about it. I said, keep your eye on Egypt, because this is purely a domestic revolution, a domestic revolt in the Arab world. But foreign policy issues will come into play. Turkey, the US, England, Iran, uh, Israel will come into play, and they're starting to come into play now. Because dignity uh, is not only a domestic issue. Dignity is a domestic and a foreign policy issue together. But can I ask the four of you, is it really fair to blame Israel for the repression and authoritarian rule, generations of it, of Arab leaders, Saddam Hussein, Hosni Mubarak, um, Sadat and, and, um, and uh, others before him, the leadership in Yemen. Uh, is, it, is it really rational to blame Israel when these, when these individuals had their own reasons for instilling authoritarian rule and denying their own people democratic rights? You're right, it's not rational and I'm not blaming Israel. I'm just saying that there's an indirect consequence uh, it's not Israel that created Saddam Hussein, but it is the relationship between Israel, Western powers, especially the United States, and the Soviets in their day as well, and with their client regimes as well. It's not just a Western problem, it's a foreign policy big power problem, that all of these countries were uh, developed as police states, as security states, that completely denied the rights of their citizens, partly, partly because of the Arab-Israeli uh, uh, conflict. But Clearly, the main problem is domestic uh, authoritarianism. In and each country. In, in, within the Arab countries. But you can't delink these things. You can't separate them. They have to be seen. And, and that's why you're seeing people in the Arab world revolting. And when you probe beneath the surface, they're revolting against their own uh, 
authoritarian <coughs> security states, they're revolting against what's going on to the Palestinians and Israelis, and they're revolting against foreign interference. Look at what Egyptians are saying about you know, American aid. They're telling the Americans, don't come here. We don't want your money. We don't want your democracy promotion. There's a very clear message if people take the time to listen. And one of the absolute critical uh, dic uh, challenges now is for people in the Western world, Europe, North America, and elsewhere, not to repeat the same mistakes they made in the last 60 years, which is to refuse to listen to what Arabs are saying. Because Arabs are speaking out now for the first time clearly, and we should make an effort to really listen to them carefully. Karim. Yeah, uh, just, just to, to add to this, I think there's two important points, and I, I agree. Uh, the first, again, is to reiterate, I think there's this false dichotomy, which has come especially in the press here, between internal and external. As though, you know, if, if you're revolting against uh, sort of a security regime authoritarian in, in Egypt and Libya and places like this, somehow that's, that it's either domestic or it's foreign policy. And these, it's linked. These security states were created and sustained by outside support. So this outside support lent a certain legitimacy and, and air of credibility to the regimes that then allowed them to go in and, and take care of their own people and remove the domestic political actor, the Arab actor, as a, as a significant player in the region or world politics. What's interesting today is that now this, is, this shackle is being removed. And, and as I agree with Dan, I think that it's very, very important that the Arab domestic political actor has become important again. We're all now, everyone's tracking Libya and Bahrain and Yemen and Syria as, because now we're, it's actually an important player. There's no longer a regime acting on the behalf of Israel and the United States or others. Uh, securing the domestic actor and putting them down. So it's, it's an interesting linkage, which is very important. But we're not witnessing one Arab view of the future of reform in the Middle East, because while some countries might not want to see Europe or the United States be active in these revolutions, at least in Libya, the Arab League asked NATO to intervene. And when Prime Minister Cameron and President Sarkozy were in Benghazi and Tripoli last weekend, they were cheered by the Libyan population. So, um, Rami, are you sure, or Sultan, are you sure that there isn't an interest in the Arab world in finding some international support for what's happening? Um, um, certainly, the, the, the Arab world isn't isolated. Uh, I think 50% of the world oil is there. Uh, it's a young region, strategically located. Um, you know, countries that are of importance, you know, uh, are within these states, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Israel, Turkey. You know, they're, they're all parts of this M Middle East region. So we cannot expect these, these foreign countries not to have an interest in our own, uh, um, in our own policies. However, uh, the, the question is, how do we react to that, uh, to, to that foreign interest? Do, do, we stand, do we stand still and, and wait for them to dictate how we want our policies you know, to, to, to change? Or does the, Arab, does, the, does the young Arab male and female stand up and say, I have an opinion, I have a right, this is what I think? Right. Um, Dan, I want to ask you about Egypt. Um, Rami made the point last winter when we were up in this, on this stage that Egypt, in effect, is the keystone country in the Arab world, that what happened in Egypt might have a ma major impact in the rest of the region. Does, do the Democrats, those who stand for uh, a renewed constitution and democratic elections and a democratic government, do they stand a chance against the organization of the Muslim Brotherhood on the one hand, and perhaps the reluctance of the Egyptian military to give up power in the final analysis to a democratically elected government? Well, um, I think uh, there's always a folly in trying to predict things, so I'm not going to try to predict things. But uh, I do think that they do stand a chance. And, and the reason is, is if you've seen just the protests and the shape of the protests over the course of the past eight months, uh, it's been going in a very interesting direction that it's, it's not just that, that they're allowing the military to rule um, with, a, with a free hand. It's not that the, that the Muslim Brotherhood has come in and swept uh, uniformly. There have been a series of protests over, over small issues that then turn into larger issues um, with the Democrats actually leading all of these, uh, these protests. But again, it remains to be seen, and I think it would be um, silly of me to be able to try to predict. Rami, Egypt? I think the most amazing thing that's going on in Egypt now is that after 60 years, six decades, since 1952 when the military first took over in Egypt, after 60 years of uninterrupted military rule or dominance of the political system, what we've seen in the last three months is an extraordinary change where young people as well as adults were out in the streets challenging the military, which still dominates us legally, and 
engaging them, and the military has responded. There's a give and take now. What you're seeing in Egypt today, I believe, is the birth of Arab politics. You're seeing the birth of contestation of power, peacefully, by and large, with a lot of people in the streets, unions, young people, different groups, political groups, Muslim brothers, everybody, and the military on the other side. And the military has been forced to respond. So they speeded up the trials, they delayed the election date, they, they, they gave in. In other words, there's a negotiation going on, a political negotiation between credible forces on the ground. So what you're starting to see uh, is the very beginning of the birth of politics in the Arab world. What you had in February and March was the birth of the Arab citizen. And what you have now is the birth of politics. What we want to see coming up next uh, is the birth of uh, true sovereignty and self-determination, which will come uh, later. But just one point, if I could make to your last question about the role of foreign countries. Mm -hmm. The critical word, there's one word that's critical for any foreign intervention in the Arab world, and that's legitimacy. Mm -hmm. The American intervention, the NATO intervention in Libya, was seen to be legitimate, I supported it, because it responded to the th three critical foci of legitimacy. The Libyan people, by and large, wanted help. There was a consensus in the Arab League. Whatever you think of the Arab League, still they represent the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And there was an international legitimate consensus in the Security Council. Once you have the domestic, the regional, and the international all weighing in with a legitimate uh, uh, call for intervention, then intervention becomes perfectly, I believe, acceptable. And this is the test that we have to weigh put it way in every time we have to use the test of legitimacy. Can we stay with Libya for a moment? Because if, if Egypt is considered to be the most important of the 22 revolutions, uh, Libya has been very dramatic. And now you have this people's army which needs to transform itself into legitimate, credible government that unites Benghazi and Tripoli and unites a society. How tall is that mountain that that new government is going to have to climb to be effective and to, and to get the allegiance of the Libyan people? Kareem. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, the, the easy answer is it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, we, we saw in Iraq you know, what happened, and we've seen when there, when there is intervention. I, 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 I agree and disagree with Rami on the point of intervention. I think uh, the intervention, there was agreement. There was a certain amount of legitimacy that came by the Security Council and the fact that the Arab League uh, gave it a, a, a political okay and that certainly meant most Libyans uh, welcomed it. Uh, but I think the, the Security Council resolution and the authorization was quite limited, and they exceeded the Senate. I think it sets a precedent which could be dangerous. Uh, I'm, I'm not convinced that, the, that, that a regime change in any of its forms, with the extent of NATO involvement, the extent of special forces on the ground, is going to be positive in the longer term. I think protecting civilians, yes, uh, especially when it was first done and there was threats to the civilians. I think, that was, I think that, there was a more or less universal support for that. But beyond that, it, it started, it, it ended up in, in more mission creep, became more, it's becoming more Iraq style. Uh, and it's, it, we'll see what happens now in the coming weeks. I think what happens in the coming weeks will determine whether this is legitimized or not. But I think it's, there's a big question mark to my mind. Well, Diana and Sultan, let's turn then to Syria. Because the obvious question to ask right now, it looks as if the regime is just strong enough to survive. The opposition is strong, but not quite strong enough to succeed, there is um, a stalemate between the two forces. Is, is, is there going to be any call in the Arab world for a similar military intervention in Syria as we saw in, in Libya? I doubt it. Um, and the reason that I doubt it is uh, for a number of reasons. One is uh, the, the gas and oil supplies are not, are not present as they are in, um, in Libya. Second, uh, 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 sorry, Bashar al-Assad hasn't been in power as long as Gaddafi has been in power. And uh, thirdly, is there's always the question of, of Iran and um, how Iran factors into it. So for those three reasons, I don't think that there is going to be any call for foreign intervention. I think they're going to uh, keep, uh, keep along the same path of Security Council resolutions and trying to isolate Syria. But I don't think that we're going to see a NATO-style uh, intervention. Um, I think uh, that uh, Syria is going to be a litmus test, especially for uh, Russia. Russia felt that it lost with Libya. It felt that it lost with even with Egypt and with other countries and with Iraq. It does. It, it needs to make a stand. It w it will uh, put its foot uh, put its foot down and say, "This is my ally." And we heard what the Russian envoy said when he visited Damascus. Uh, now, the Syria is very tricky because uh, uh, one of the most significant countries in the region, Saudi Arabia, withdrew its ambassador. Another country that plays a big role in, the, in, in, in Arab mediation efforts, Qatar, uh, 
with Ruth's ambassador. Turkey is very disenfranchised with, with Syria. So uh, it looks like it's a stalemate. I, I, I wouldn't also make a, a, a prediction, but Bashar is very popular in, in, in some, some parts of Damascus and Aleppo. Um, so it's, it's not as easy to, to dislodge him as some other leaders. Mm -hmm. Sultan, you, you um, are a citizen of the United Arab Emirates, and it's that part of the Arab world that seems to be, that seems to have surfed through the tsunami of change, if you will, you know, been immune from the changes, with the exception of Bahrain. How do Emiratis and Saudis view this wave of reform, and how soon before it hits your shores? Oh, this is the question that's going to get me into trouble. Um, <laughs> we don't want to do well, that. <laughs> well, OK. Um, um, <clears throat> basically, uh, the, the Gulf states w were very much part of the, of the uh, Arab awakenings. Qatar played a huge role with its Al Jazeera satellite channel, which was not neutral during the Egyptian revolution. Uh, Qatar also, Qatar and the UAE very much, where I come from, very much supported the Libyan rebels and provided this legitimacy that uh, Rami was talking about. In fact, six out of Qatar's nine planes were taking part in, in, uh, in, the, in the Libyan effort. So, in the uh, NATO operation. Uh, yes, in the NATO operation. Yeah. And, and the UAE also provided a huge support. Kuwait, for instance, gave them $180 million. Qatar gave them $400 million. So we were very much part of it. And even after the, uh, after the Arab uh, the revolution, and after the fall of Mubarak in Egypt, the, uh, you know, the UAE came in with $3 billion. Qatar promised $10 billion. Uh, um, the Saudi Arabia promised uh, $4 billion. $2 billion went to Jordan. Very much a, a financial kind of reaction outside their, their neighborhood. Inside their neighborhood, uh, we had Oman, which is a, a, a sultanate uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, there was, a, there was a, a mini uprising of several hundred people. Um, the, the Sultan of Oman uh, reacted by sacking 15 out of the 19 ministers, including three of his relatives and closest advisors. So it was very much absorbed quickly. Uh, and he promised to give um, legislative powers to the Council of Oman. So that could be put in the, in the, in the uh, column of uh, you know, quick reaction by the government to absorb the anger. On the other side is the tricky issue of Bahrain. Uh, with Bahrain, the uprising lasted for a month, from February 14th to mid-March. Um, the UAE and Saudi Arabia sent around 1,500 uh, troops into Bahrain. Uh, there, was, there were very heavy negotiations. To support the king. To support the, uh, at the request of the, of the king, uh, to support the government. And um, we don't know the details, but um, you know, the uprising was, was put down. And uh, there, there was a national dialogue that took place that was very much um, supported by the Gulf states. However, the opposition, the main opposition party, which got five out of 300 seats, was unhappy and withdrew. So Bahrain is very much like a, uh, uh, you know, like a kettle that's been, uh, you know, the, the, the lid has been really tightened on it. And, and, and I really hope that there is an exit. However, uh, things look like they're getting very tricky over there. Between the Shia and Sunni? Between the government and the, and the, and the opposition. In Bahrain. So this leads to another question that I want, wanted to ask the four of you. Um, can we grade in September 2011, in the short term, who were the winners and who were the losers? I mean, to think about some of the external actors here to the Arab world. Obviously, there's Israel. What impact have, have these events had on Israel? Second country is Turkey. Prime Minister Erdogan just made a triumphal tour through, if you will, through North Africa. He's become a leading spokesperson for the Palestinians. A third country is the United States of America. How are these countries done in reacting, leading, following uh, to these events? Diana. Well, um, so taking uh, the case of Israel first, Israel has uh, largely stepped out of, uh, of dealing with the Arab uprisings, um, which, taking the approach of to try to wait and see first, particularly when it comes to Egypt and uh, when it's come to, to Syria. And, but I, I think overall, it's going to be a loser. And the reason is, is that no matter what happens in Egypt, they won't be able to instill a Mubarak-like figure in Egypt any longer. So it's no longer going to be the case that um, the rights of 80 million Egyptians are, are secondary to that of Israel, in, which is the way that it was in the past. Even things like uh, the border between the Gaza Strip and Egypt, that's going to be an issue that becomes much more on the domestic table than it was in the past. And so in the long term, I think vis-a-vis -vis, um, Egypt, Israel's going to be a loser, unless it does something with 
Palestinians, which I don't think that they will anytime soon. Um, in terms of Turkey, you're absolutely right. He did his victory lap, and he'll continue to do more victory laps uh, throughout the Arab world because of the stance that, he's, that, uh, that they've taken in terms of championing um, Palestinian rights and in terms of championing the rights of uh, the Arab people. And finally, when it comes to the United States, I think also, um, also a loser, simply because they've, been, they've, they've taken a, an approach that has been hesitant uh, when it comes to some of the protests, uh, on the wrong side when it comes to some of the other protests, such as in Bahrain, and uh, has not taken a really consistent approach to, to the region as a whole and completely ignored the issue of the Palestinians. Thank you. Kareem. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree largely with what Dan is saying. I think, uh, I think Israel is, has lost. It's being, certainly in the region, being associated with the, the other regimes that are falling. So there is an association between Israel and these autocratic regimes, and that's sort of part of the same era, part of the same historical era. So this is being looked at in a very interesting ways. Uh, on the flip side, I mean, all the autocratic regimes have lost. Uh, interestingly, even Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon, I think, is, is, is under pressure and is, uh, questioning itself and questioning its own strategy. Now, in, inside Lebanon, it's an interesting, especially depending on what happens in Syria, I think there could be question marks there. Um, I think the Palestinian Authority was losing quite a bit. Now they're trying to resuscitate themselves with this initiative at the UN. Um, but I think the Palestinian Authority is linked to Israel and to the other Arab regimes, and, and they've so far been, been losing. Rahmi, I wanted to ask you about Iran, and you can comment on the other qu countries in play. Now, we had the extraordinary situation two weeks ago of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad speaking out publicly to give advice to Bashar al-Assad not to use violence against his own people. This is the same person who put down you know, the people of Iran brutally in 2009. How, what do you read? Are the Iranians now worried that this revolution might shift to Iran in the future? The Iranian people might look at the Arab people and say that this is worthy of, um, of, of emulation. Well, the Iranians had their revolution in 79, and, and there's a whole new stirring of populist demands going on now, and has been going on since Khatami's two elections uh, 10, 12 years ago. So there's a, f a ferment in Iran that's been going on for, for over a decade. Um, and I think it is uh, clear, I was in Iran last year for the first time and, and saw it firsthand, uh, it's clear that the situation in Iran is not sustainable for a long time, and there are great uh, forces. Iran, to me, is like the Soviet Union in the, in the mid-1980s, that there's great underlying tensions and stresses that will break through it, uh, at some point. Um, the, the relationship between uh, Iran and the Arab awakenings is a very complicated one. It is uh, articulated in a vocabulary of hypocrisy, which is extremely common for any external power, including the United States uh, and Israel and others that deal with the Arab world, that hypocrisy is a, is a normal operating procedure. So they'll support democracy in one place and not support it somewhere, somewhere else. They'll support UN resolutions implemented in one place and not support them somewhere else. So we shouldn't worry about countries that seem to take a hypocritical view. That's how powers operate. They do it based on their interests. The important point, if we want to try to leave, the important point in trying to uh, to identify winners and, and, and losers and who gains and who, who loses is to look at the bottom line criterion. Historically in the Arab world, meaning in the last three, four generations, there were three things that mattered. Oil, Israel, and regime stability, Arab regime stability. Arab regime stability has now been shattered, that you can change regimes. If people want them changed, they can be changed. But oil and Israel remain sacred. They cannot be touched. And this is why we see a different policy in Bahrain to somewhere else. But the shattering of the regime stability uh, dictate means that there's a new dictate that replaces it, which is the consent of the government. A democratic, participatory, accountable system that, that means public opinion matters. And I believe the winners will be those countries that engage with that criterion, and the losers will be those countries that continue to oppose it. And I think it's a very simple equation, because what you've had unleashed now is the power of several hundred million ordinary Arab men and women. We have celebrated this kind of uh, situation in the fall of the Soviet Union, in the anti-apartheid revolt in South Africa, in the democratization of South America, in the American Revolution, in the American Civil Rights Movement. We, if we're honest, we would celebrate it in the Arab world, where hundreds of millions of ordinary people say that their voices count and their rights matter and they want them enshrined in constitutional systems of law. 
Anybody who supports that will be a winner. Anybody who doesn't will eventually be a loser. So last question before we go to questions from the audience, and it, it just it, it plays right off your final comment, Rami, because well said. I think if you had a representative of the Obama administration here tonight, they would say, of course the United States supports reform, greater freedoms, greater democracy throughout the Arab world. But they look at an Arab world, which is very much divided on this issue. And so you saw President Obama very swiftly, in my judgment, turn our support from Mubarak to the streets, to the people in Tahrir Square in Egypt, support the revolution in Libya as well, and certainly, perhaps belatedly, support the revolution in Syria. But you saw that same administration not support the demonstrators in Pearl Square in Bahrain, out of deference to the UAE and Saudi Arabia, out of deference to stability in the Gulf because of oil and gas, because of the containment of Iran, and because of the help of those regimes supply on counterterrorism. So if you're the American president, you're balancing these, our values, which are dear to our country, but also our pragmatic interests, oil, counterterrorism, counter Iran. From an American viewpoint, is not that balancing the proper way, if you're the president of the United States, to react to 22 different, very different dramas throughout the Arab world? Is there really one policy that can cover the entire Arab Revolution, Sultan. Last question. Um, I mean, uh, I, I always <laughs> try to put my, my, myself in the, in, the, in the other side when I, when I comment. I think uh, the Americans have their, their, their interests, but, but I, I'm more concerned about what our interests are. Sure. It's more important for me that the, that, the, the young, that the young Arab has rights. It's more important for me that a young Arab has a voice. And I don't care what the American reaction is, as long as it doesn't stand in my way. Okay, fair enough. Carry on. I, no, I, th I, think, I think there are important, there's important issues. The U.S. foreign policy, I think, has to be, again, contextualized, not just now, but over the past 10 years and even the past 20 or 30 years. And it has lost tremendous credibility in the, in the Arab region. It's lost its foreign policy, has gone from being very pro-supporting of Israel and at the same time supporting of the security regimes over the past 20 years. Uh, in addition to, I mean, they were, who, who was supporting uh, the Gaddafi regime over the past few years and rehabilitated? It was the UK, it was the US, it was other Western regimes. Uh, so th this, this is, you know, this, you need to contextualize this in addition to the fact that there is, as Ram was saying, some Hippocratic sort of going back and forth supporting some states here but not theirs. It's crystallized, I think, in the question of Palestine where the Obama administration is going out of its way to try to deny even the attempts of the creation of a Palestinian state. That is, that is part of US foreign policy, declared foreign policy, which is declaration of a state. Uh, so th this thing is being noted. I think there's a lot of l lack of credibility. I think there was, you know, the U.S. has done well in some cases to put itself in the background a little bit, not not to be first among those in interventions Libya, in instance. Libya, for instance. Yeah. I think that was a, that was a wise move. Uh, I think in Syria it's wise not to intervene, not to be pushing too strong, perhaps behind the scenes, but not to be seen to be pushing too hard. I think that's also a, a clever move. But overall. U.S. foreign policy in general, the past 20, 30 years, I think, is there's a lot of lack of credibility. And they need to understand, I think the U.S. needs to understand that the important interest is stability and having a good relations with the Arab people, which is now the new actor on the stage, which is something which was the case in the early part of the 20th century. Thank you very much, Kareem. Diana, I wanted you to answer this question as well about the U.S., but you know, since we have you here and um, the Palestinian delegation is arriving in New York, What's your best sense of what's going to happen on the resolution on Palestinian statehood this week at the UN? Well, uh, as you know, Nick, it's, it, this is not a, a simple I issue. It's not something that's going to be resolved by the week's end. I do think that there's going to be an application for membership uh, to the UN that's put before the Security Council, as is required under um, the UN rules. I also think that there's going to be a General Assembly resolution that tries to um, put forward this issue and perhaps upgrade Palestine's status. But I don't think that anything's going to be resolved. But uh, that's just on the technical side of things. I think that there are much broader questions that, that this bid is now raising, which is, uh, what is the role of the United States when it comes to the issue of Palestine? Is it going to actually back uh, the, the statements that it's made in the past that the Palestinians should be free and have a state of their own? Or is it going to, to not do that? Uh, and then it also raises questions among Palestinians that Palestinians themselves are now asking, is this the most effective means? 
does, is this a leadership that represents all Palestinians or is it just representing a segment of Palestinian society? And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens by the week end, but of course nothing will be concluded by the end of the week. Thank you very much. Rami, you get the last word. Well, I was going to say as usual. I think <laughs> to, bring, you deserve it. to bring all this stuff uh, together, I think what we're dealing with in the Arab world and in the Middle East as a whole, including with the interaction of foreign powers, and it's very dramatic now in the UN with the US and the Europeans and uh, everybody and Israel and everybody in the UN now having to grapple with this issue. We should understand that this isn't just a historic moment for the Arab people. This is a historic moment for everybody. And this is a moment when actually everybody gets a second chance. You get to correct your mistakes, including our mistakes in the Arab world. Um, so if you, if you have acted uh, with a consistent sense of, uh, of hypocrisy, for instance, as a foreign power, it doesn't matter which one you are, there's about 15 or 20 of them I can name, and you've acted hypocritically and inconsistently in dealing with Arabs and Israelis or dealing with nuclear power in Israel or in Iran or in other places, you get a chance to do it again. And I think it's a moment f to, uh, to uh, take advantage of an opportunity that we, it doesn't do very much good to anybody for us to point out the mistakes that all of us have made. We've all been guilty of incredible uh, mistakes and, and stupidity and simplicity and, 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 and immoral behavior. Uh, but we all have an opportunity now to do it again and, and to get it right. And, and this raises the question, Nick, you answered about, well, what do we expect from the US in terms of its interest versus its, uh, its morality? Uh, what we expect is a minimum degree of honesty and clarity that is coupled to a graded degree of consistency. In other words, I don't expect the US to be consistent immediately in Bahrain and in Libya and in Syria. But what I do expect is a minimum of honesty and clarity about what does the United States actually support? And if it does actually support the rights of Israel over Palestinians and the safeguarding of oil over the safeguarding of citizenship dignity in the Arab world, tell us that. That's okay. And then we'll deal with it and we'll figure out how to respond. But we need clarity. We need clarity and we need some consistency. If it can be anchored in legality and international law and legitimacy, that's even better. But not all countries do that. But what's important, I'll finish by saying, is that what we have going on is not just the birth of citizenship and politics, as I mentioned, in Arab countries. We have something equally important going on, which is the birth of nations acting as nations. What the Saudis have done in the Gulf, you might criticize it, you might like it, I, I'm critical of it, but the Saudis are acting like a real country for the first time uh, in ever. They've been sending their army around, they've been fighting in Yemen, they've been in Bahrain, they've going and, and the Qataris are in Libya. I mean, it's, there's extraordinary stuff going on. Three out of the six Gulf Cooperation Council countries have been moving their, uh, four out of the six, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and, and Kuwait have been moving troops around in the last six months. This is extraordinary. But what it is, is countries acting like countries instead of protectorates whose policies are dictated by somebody else. And so you've got citizens and you've got countries being born. This is an, an amazing moment. And people in the world should understand the nature of this transformation and deal with it with clarity and some consistency. And I think in the long run, this will be better for everybody. The Arabs, the Israelis, the Turks, the Iranians, the Americans, and the Micronesians will all benefit from this process. I guess I would be charitable towards President Obama myself at this stage in the sense that I think that he's acted tactically. And he's really seen each of these dramas play out individually and especially Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, I think defended American interests very well. I would agree with you. We've yet to see a strategic American approach, which is difficult when there's such a diverse set of forces underway. But well said, and thanks to all of you uh, for your honesty and for your opinions. And now the audience will get a chance to ask them questions. Here's how this works. We have four microphones, two in the ground floor here, two in the balconies. I'll call on the individuals. I was remiss earlier in not saying that in addition to the Institute of Politics, um, our Middle East initiative is co-sponsor of this evening's event and our executive director, Hilary Antizi, is here in the front row. She has been a great director of a widely expanding uh, Middle East program here at the Kennedy School. So I would just say three guidelines to questioners. Um, please state your name. Please uh, be brief and make sure a question mark is attached to that statement <laughs> at the end. Yes, sir. <laughs> 
please. I think it followed the directions. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for presenting today. It's been really interesting. Um, my name is Federico Cuadra. I'm here uh, at the Kennedy School. I'm a joint JD MPA. And my question goes towards the end game of a lot of the uh, movements we're seeing in Egypt. Uh, a lot of people say that they want greater access to democracy, but what does that actually look like? Are they, do they want something like an American style form with a presidential democracy? or they would like something more along European lines, like a parliamentary democracy. What does it mean, and what are they looking for in the end game? Thank you. Deanna, do you want to start as our legal scholar yeah, with that? I can actually defer to Rami on this one. Okay. Well, let me give it a try. I, I would say I think it's an unfair question, but a, a, an, an intelligent, good question, but unfair in the sense that nobody asked what did the people of Czechoslovakia want, what did the people in Belarus want, what did the people in the Soviet Empire want, when they changed. Nobody asked about the future end game of other people who liberated themselves from oppressive regimes. But it's interesting that this question is asked of the Arabs, that people want to know a little bit where are we going. They're not quite sure if we should be free. I'm not saying this about you personally. I'm saying this about generally this, this theme. We hear this a lot about what should we be concerned about. The Muslim brothers are going to take over in Egypt. Is going to be another Iran? Is this good for Israel? Is this good for oil? There's all these qualifying questions that come up all the time. The reality is we don't know. Nobody knows. What we do know is that you have millions of people who are breaking the chains of their own subjugation, and they want to create a more uh, stable, dignified world. The one common denominator across the board, all across the region, you can see this in every revolt in every country, is made up of two critical elements. One is that everybody wants constitutional reform. They want constitutional systems of citizenship where their rights are clear and there's mechanisms to guarantee them. And the second thing they want is social justice. This is a revolution for social justice. It's unbelievably important. So I think if you put those two things together, then let the system evolve and we will have a variety of different kinds of uh, end games which will evolve uh, by themselves. But can I just say, and perhaps Kareem, you want to address this, how about uh, reform for women's rights in Saudi Arabia? How about reform of democratic rights in the UAE, which, where there currently are no democratic rights of the people there? Are we going to see reform extend to, throughout the Arab world, or just in some countries of the Arab world? Karim. Uh, I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Sultan answer the, the, the part you were asking. He but, may want but you but to the, answer that the, question. The answer, no, of, course, <laughs> of course, the answer is yes, rights for everybody. I mean, that's the easy answer, of course. Uh, but I, I think it is important. I, I began by saying the question of whether it's uprising revolution depends on what happens. I think Rami. Put, uh, made an important point, which is the question of within the constitutional reforms, within all, there's a big struggle going on. And the struggle is about whether to put, how to incorporate elements of social justice, economic redistribution, uh, perhaps moving away from the kinds of economic policies, this kind of neoliberal economic policies that have taken place over the past 20, 30 years that have not led to wealth uh, across the board. It's, it's led to wealth in particular parts of, of you know, merchant classes, et cetera, at the very top but it's not made its way down. And this is something which is being considered. And the question, of course, is there's a lot of interest involved in this thing, but that will tell whether it's a revolution or not, depending on, on, on that particular issue. As far as women's rights, I think, of course. I mean, I think this is an issue which is fundamental. And again, uh, it, without that, it will not be complete. They'll Thank probably you. happen a so lot faster in Saudi Arabia than they happened in the United States in terms of <laughs> women's rights to vote. Let's hope so. We'll <laughs> hold you to that. Sultan. Um, well, the, uh, the, I mean, the, the, you said there is no democratic, uh, there, there is no democracy in the UAE or in Qatar. This is the way the system is, is made. I let you in on a secret between us. A lot of us in the, a lot of us in the Gulf, really wanted the Bahraini experiment, the Bahraini, uh, you know, to work. We wanted, mm -hmm. we wanted the end game to work. Now, none of us wanted any bloodshed. None of us wanted any anyone to get hurt. But we all wanted the vision of a constitutional monarchy. To, 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 uh, to succeed. And, and, and we, for a period of time, we all looked upon what was happening in Bahrain in the first few days of uh, you know, uh, mid-February as, as a, perhaps you know, a, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel that we will have constitutional monarchies in, 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 the, in the Gulf. But then that dream was ended. And it, uh, in fact, where you do have constitutional monarchies-ish, uh, Jordan and Morocco, uh, the Gulf states are trying to come in, and and, and 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 doing so, I think there's a lot of financial incentives to maybe, you know, uh, take it easy and not uh, not rush things. 
Thank you. Deanna, please. Yeah, precisely. Just to add on that, I mean, the, the fact that they were both invited in to be part of the GCC uh, indicates that, that these, these monarchies are going to go out of their way to um, stand in opposition to all of the other Arab regimes, but are going to go out of their way as well to try to protect the monarchies that exist. So I think that we're going to see a, a different configuration in the Middle East with uh, the monarchies protecting one another and uh, the remaining countries having to, to, to fend off these uprisings. That's interesting. Thank you. Yes, sir, you have a question. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to th say thank you for coming out this evening. I'm Second Class Lord from the uh, Coast Guard Academy. My question is, uh, with the Palestinian Authority appealing to the United Nations for statehood, do you think it's detrimental to their cause that they refuse to negotiate directly with the Israelis? Diana? Oh, is that for me? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I was, uh, as, as uh, Nick mentioned in the introduction, I was part of the negotiating team. Look, there, there have been no negotiations that have taken place for about, about a good decade. Um, there have been attempts to have talks and what have you, but there's been really no negotiations over the course of the past 10 years. And what has emerged um, is a very clear record of the fact that as many times as they try to sit down and negotiate, um, the, the Israelis are simply unwilling to come to the table and to either halt settlement activity or to really um, allow the Palestinians to live freely. This has, been, this has emerged in the Al Jazeera leaks that, that came out in January of, of this year. So. Uh, the fact that they're going to the United Nations is, is a strategy. And it's a strategy, um, in the words of Mahmoud Abbas, not to try to get rid of the process of negotiations, uh, although I think that negotiations should come to an end, but as a, as a strategy to try to bring to the fore the fact that this, that this conflict has gone on for so many years, that negotiations have, have led nowhere, and that the international community should now get involved in, uh, in trying to resolve this. On that, on that aspect, I actually agree. I think that uh, we really have to put an end to this idea that there are going to be um, fair and even negotiations. It, it didn't happen in the past. I'm not so sure why we should continue to pursue it in the future. Uh, the Yates has never really taken an even hand when it came to these negotiations. And so I think that it's time for something new, something different. I'm not sure if the UN is the, is the best route for it. Uh, I'm a little bit critical of it, but I do think that something different has to happen. Thank you. Kareem. Yes, I, again, I agree, and I think it's interesting that uh, in, implicit in your question is, I mean, there's this is question of Palestinian authority interest versus the Palestinian people interest, and I'm not sure it's the same thing. Uh, this, is, this is part of what's going on in the region today. As I said, I suggested, I think, that the Palestinian Authority is doing this in order to save itself, institutionally, bureaucratically, to preserve a role for itself, because without this, it has absolutely no meaning anymore beyond and kind of you know, regurgitating the same old cliches and discussions and, and essentially having very little ability to, to shape any kind of negotiating position at all. For the Palestinian people, I think uh, there's a lot more, there's a diversity of opinion, there's a lot more interesting discussions. Uh, it's significant, I think, that the Palestinian Authority did not consult the Palestinians largely before they came to the UN. So something as significant as coming to the UN to declare statehood, again, by the way, they've already declared, they've already declared independence, uh, and have already been recognized by you know, over 100 states. This notion of coming without consulting your people, without even, ha without even consulting key partners within your own alleged government it, it's, is a very strange uh, thing. And I think it's, just, it's done in order to preserve itself. And I don't think this serves the Palestinian people necessarily because they don't know what the implications are. That's quite clear. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Ali. I'm from Iran. And uh, unfortunately, uh, after the glorious Arab Spring that we saw in Egypt and Tunisia. I, I was witnessing this scene, these scenes of uh, turning down the flag of American in the American University of Cairo last week and uh, um, attacking two embassies in Cairo. Uh, that reminds me of my own country in 1979. Uh, it seems that there is a ten growing tension about Israel and United States in Middle East. Uh, what, my question is, what would remain of those moderate parties in Middle East who want to deal peacefully with West after this, uh, after this uh, move that it seems that the United States will go for blocking it in the United Nations? And what would remain of those, what should they do, those who want to deal peacefully with best in Middle East? 
So thank you very much for your question. Um, Kareem Sultan, do you want to? Start with that? I'm not sure I understand I the question, question entirely. Okay. Uh, do you do you want to rephrase your question briefly? I heard you. I heard you asking whether there's a future for peaceful reform in the Middle East and those who stand for, for peaceful, peaceful uh, negotiations uh, between uh, people in uh, Middle East and West after this blockade that uh, I think will uh, this veto that United States will uh, use in on the Palestinian United question. Yes. So what is the, what is the future of peaceful reform? I mean, I think, I think yeah, the, 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 again, the simple answer is, of course, yes, it's not, the issue is never, I mean, just to be clear, I, I'm not sure you're implying this, but just to be clear, this is not a civilizational issue, it's not a clash of cultures, not, none of this kind of stuff which gets trumpeted. This is a question of, uh, in, in the case of the US, US policy, which is rejected and, and, and found to be extremely, uh, that lacks credibility in the region. So this is a function of the US aligning, as Rami suggested earlier, the U.S. aligning its, its own interests and its own sense of foreign policy with, at least now, with this opportunity that Rami was talking about, to, to, to realign itself historically, which was always the case, with Arabs and with the Arab people. There's, no, there's nothing, there's nothing unpeaceful about the Arabs per se, but if there is a question of you're either there are rights and are you for these rights or are you against these rights, there, there is a struggle. It's not a U.S. versus the Arabs. It's not a Christian versus Muslim. It's none of this kind of stuff. It's policy and reactions to policy. Yes, sir. Are you looking at me? Yes, I am. Um, yes. My name is Michael Brower. A um, hundred years ago, I studied at this school long before it was known as the Kennedy School. I got a PhD from the uh, Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. My question has to do with how we continue learning from the Arab, about the Arab world after the four of you have left, starting tomorrow morning. I don't trust the American news media. I don't trust our daily newspapers. I don't trust our major TV channels. Are there any daily or weekly or monthly English language journals that you would recommend for those of us who want to continue to learn about the Arab world? Sultan? I, I get my We news. have several representatives of the American media here. I'm going to give them right a re response if they'd like. But, but in the meantime, Mr. Sultan, what do you think? I get a lot of my news from, I use social media, so I, so which, which basically filters a lot of the news that I want. If I want to get news from Egypt, then I'll follow maybe 10 or 20 different feeds that, that, will, that will give me a, maybe a, a, an, um, a more general view of the situation rather than perhaps one specific channel or one single newspaper. Rahmi, you're a journalist. Well, I, I follow the media very closely, and I would suggest that uh, there are several very good websites now that provide really, really good in-depth analytical uh, analysis about the, the Middle East and the Arab world and the Arab-Israeli conflict and other things. Uh, Jadaliya is one. The Middle East Report, Merip, is another one. Uh, the Electronic Intifada is a third. Uh, there's many, many others, but those I would give you those. But I think it's very important also to make sure that you go to the pro-Israeli websites as well to see their views and then make a decision. Uh, because uh, if you only read one side, you're going to get a distorted picture. You have to really see both sides, and then I'm convinced that you will come down closer to the Arab side than to the Israeli <laughs> side, because, because the facts speak for themselves. And this is why the vast majority of the world will vote for a Palestinian state, with the exception of Israel, the U.S., Micronesia, and one or two <laughs> Europeans. So I think it's really important to uh, get a wide perspective. But what's you, good now is you have those views that are available that give you a more balanced and a more in-depth and a more nuanced uh, analysis uh, of what's going on. And you do have in the mainstream media some very good people, including some tonight, David Greenway and others, who, who do some very good, honest analysis because they actually know the area. They go there. Uh, they don't sit in the United States and get people from the Washington uh, bureaucracy telling them, but they actually know the reality on the ground. So th I wouldn't write off the whole American media. Uh, but I think the, the, a lot of it clearly uh, is very uh, imbalanced, and it, it's one of the reasons why we've gotten nowhere, because there's not, there has not been a public, serious, honest discussion uh, in this country, and policy has remained the same, and therefore the region has remained stuck. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, Scott Little from the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Um, I'd like to ask a question about a country that hasn't had that much airtime. Uh, this evening, which is Lebanon, uh, which has seen more than its fair share of conflicts. And with two professors from uh, AUB, I'd like to get your views on what you think the, uh, the repercussions 
of the current Arab revolutions might be on Lebanon, uh, and specifically on the polarized uh, political scene there between the two principal blocks of March 8th and March 14th. And, and let me just add to your very good question for Karim and Rahmi. Um, what's, what's happened to Hezbollah? Is it stronger now as a force in the government, but might it weaken if its Syrian and Iranian benefactors might suffer ultimately from the consequences of the revolutions, Karim? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, there's two answers. I think the first answer is that, unfortunately, not much has happened because of the revolutions. I mean, domestically, internally, not very much has happened. There was an attempt at a sort of anti-sectarian you know, rallying, you know, as to sort of to link it to all the other uprisings. That fizzled out very quickly because the system, unlike all the other Arab countries, is, is already decentralized. And so there's no one place that you can go to and topple a dictator. It doesn't work like that. You, there, is, there is a measure of democratic space. You can talk, you can say things, everybody can curse everybody else. So there's not, you know, there's not that kind of pressure. Uh, so it fizzled out, and people are still trying to figure out how, do we, how does the system change uh, when, when it's so decentralized and, and so adaptable in a way that Egypt's under Mubarak and Tunisia and these were not. So unfortunately, not much has happened, but hopefully that will begin to, to push. The second part of the question is the question of uh, Syria and, and the repercussions of Syria on Lebanon. This is it's not so much because of domestic factors, but clearly uh, if if something were to happen to the Syrian regime, and I don't think it's imminent, by the way, but if in the longer term something does happen, uh, clearly there are implications for Hezbollah, and uh, Hezbollah, I think, is quite worried. I think it does weaken one way or the other. I think uh, not necessarily in the short term, because there's plenty of, I mean, they, they, have, they have a good... Uh, they're able to, I mean, they have, they have a good amount of influence, let's say, in, yeah. in, in the country. And so without Syria there, it's clearly something which is not going to be beneficial, depending on what happens later. I think there's just one misconception, that is, if the Syrian regime were to fall, suddenly you'll get a very pro-Israeli sort of re regime that comes. I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. So, you know, it depends how that plays out. Do you agree, Rami? Yeah, I'm, I'm not an academic. I'm a journalist masquerading as an academic. But I, uh, I, I, I go to Syria regularly, and I talk to people on both sides there, the government and the opposition, and I followed it closely. And my impression is that the, a change in Syria, whether it's regime change or regime transformation or something, will have far more impact on the region than anything that's happened to date in Egypt or Libya or anywhere. Mm -hmm. Syria is so critical to this region because of its links with every single actor and, and conflict in the area, um, and, and, and this direct uh, relationship with Israel as well. So I think you, keep, you have to keep your eye on Syria. I believe the Syrian regime is in deep trouble, uh, but uh, still has a very small capacity to uh, transform itself. But gradually, this system of government in Syria is on the way out. There's no question about it. The only question is, will it go quickly? Will it go slowly? Uh, because they've lost domestic legitimacy to a large extent, they've lost almost total regional legitimacy, and there's massive international pressure. The three loci of, of legitimacy and pressure are all operative at once, and they can't put up with it. And the economic screws will be the ones that will cause one of the pillars of the regime support uh, to finally crack, and that'll speed up the transformation. Uh, it may take six months, it may take two, three years, but I think it will happen, and this will have huge implications uh, for Iran and for Hezbollah, uh, both of which understand, I believe, that their days in their present configuration are numbered. They can't just continue doing what they've been doing for many, many uh, years. So the, the, the transformations, I think, of most of these resistance uh, and deterrence uh, parties, as they, as they call themselves, I think they're in for huge uh, changes. They still have a lot of legitimacy and support around the region because the issues that they play on are issues that matter to a lot of people, including Arab-Israeli issues, uh, foreign interference in the region, and things of that nature. So it's not a simple black or white situation. So we have 10 minutes left. Uh, we'll try to get in as many questions as possible, brief questions, brief responses, and please, sir. Yeah, hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Haytham al -Salama. I'm a first-year student at the Kennedy School at the Master of Public Policy program. My question is to Sultan, but the panel in general. Uh, you stated that uh, and you specified an example of Qatar and UAE to be countries that were secretly hoping for the uh, Bahraini revolution to be successful and the move to constitutional democracy. I'm just, my, my first part of the question is, do you believe constitutional monarchies are the right model to govern our countries and that region? Or 
maybe the current existing monarchy system is what best suits that region. And are we seeking democracy for democracy's sake, just to mimic the word democracy that exists in the Western world? Although I don't believe it's actually as colorful as it's painted to be. But, or are we seeking democracy for social justice and economic growth, what I don't think parts of the countries in that region lacks for now. So why are we seeking democracy? Thank you, Sultan. Uh, um, I didn't say that, uh, that the countries, the governments, were, were hoping for the reform movement to succeed. I was saying that a lot of the reformers, a lot of the people in the ground, wanted the, the initial demands, the initial demands, I should emphasize, uh, of a constitutional monarchy to succeed. I believe personally, and I come from one of the monarchies, I believe that the only way forward for the Gulf states, if families want to remain, uh, is through uh, having constitutional monarchies. Otherwise, the current system is, is, is not sustainable in the, uh, in the 21st century. You also, could, you could, buy, also, you could yeah. buy your way out, which is what the, the, the Gulf states did. They created 130,000 jobs. They, they put in $130 billion in Saudi, God knows how much, in the other Gulf states. It's not sustainable in the long term. In the end, you must move to a model where, if you want the families to remain, to a constitutional monarchy. This, this is what I meant. Thank you very much, Sultan. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Effie Michelle from the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, my question is about corruption. Uh, in all these cases, in Egypt, in uh, Yemen, in Syria, in the Palestinian uh, Authority, one of the main drivers of these protests has been corruption. It's been nepotism, it's been graft, it's been bribery, it's been resentment, deep resentment over uh, the, these regimes. What are the realistic mechanisms that can be put in place to guarantee some sort of transparency as these countries uh, transition, um, and is that possible? Is it a realistic expectation that they can actually do so? Thank you very much. Diana, do you want to start on that? Yeah, um, so I think in part, uh, you, you've, you've mentioned some, in part it's correct, in part it's not correct. Um, I don't think that it's just been a question of corruption that has led to a lot of these uprisings, and uh, it's been a question of um, uh, security regimes, uh, uh, authoritarian regimes, it's been the lack of social justice, and there's definitely one element in it, which is the lack of transparency and corruption. I think that all of these issues are going to be addressed when, when you have uh, the new governments that, that then emerge. These are critical demands that, that each, of these, uh, each of the reformist movements are, is making within each of these countries, is to be able to see more where the finances of the country are emerging, how uh, wealth is being distributed, and not so much to rely on the old system of, of wealth distribution, economic distribution that existed in the past. So it's definitely one element, but it's not the entire element uh, and not the entire reason for, for these uprisings. How it's going to be done is, I think, largely through mech legal mechanisms and through the continuation of protest. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, I'm, um, my name is Lena. I'm from the college. And um, I wanted to go back to Egypt and ask about, um, particularly regarding how fundamentally entrenched the military is in the economy of Egypt. Um, what, how, significant do you see this moment for these deeper social and economic structures? Um, and what kind of relationship do you um, kind of foresee occurring between the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the most organized force, but has always been in kind of the backdrop of uh, challenging the military, and this more like fragmented um, people, um, which, as you pointed out, is like the new pivotal actor? Thank you very much. Kareem. Yeah, look, I mean, it's good to know that Harvard students are producing these great questions. Uh, I mean, this really, I mean, it's a great question and requires a very long answer. But uh, I think what, what's important to realize is, is that there is a struggle going on now. It's very important you know, to keep in mind that there's a massive struggle going on. The outcome of the struggle will determine some of, some of the direction that, that they're going. There, is a, there are vested interests, as you know very well. The military has a lot of vested interests in the economy. There's a vested interest to keep the status quo. Uh, there's a, a hatching sort of ongoing potential alliance between the military, the Muslim brothers, between you know, various people to try to reconstitute the old regime a little bit and you know, be, put a facade of democratic elections and then keep the status quo as it is economically and socially, open up a little bit, maybe get a little class in there to get a bit of money. Uh, but I think ultimately the Egyptian people are not going to allow that. I think there's going to be struggle. I think for the next years there's going to be struggle. I think there's going to be consolidation of power and then struggles and counter struggles for the next years. Thank you, for Rami. One minute. If you're, you're, I think one of the points this raises is uh, for people in the Western world to look at the Arab world, I think with a little bit more uh, 
um, sort of l l low intensity realism. And if your question is, if you're worried about, or if you're concerned about somehow whether the men with the guns and the men who follow God should perhaps, you know, not necessarily mix together, you know, I tell you I have much bigger concerns when I look at the Republican presidential candidates when you look in this country <laughs> and where, where religion and guns mix together. So I think really what we're saying is this is a universal process uh, that militarism uh, and theology are two very powerful factors in society. They sometimes come together, they sometimes come apart. But don't worry about it. People in Egypt have been running this country for approximately 6,000 years. They know how to run a society. Uh, they know how to rule. They know how to export. They know how to trade with the world. Uh, and, and they know how to create systems uh, of stability. Well, what they've not had a chance to do is to actually do that on their own without uh, tremendous foreign interference or being run by only the men with the guns. But Rami, I think this is a serious question. Oh, it is. In the sense uh, that the Muslim Brotherhood is not running on the Republican ticket in the United States. They're running in Egypt, and they're organized. And the big question that I think Egyptians have about them is, how would they govern? Would they govern in a democratic way or an authoritarian way? That's not a question of foreign interference. I mean, what do you think about that question? No, no, that's, that's what I heard being asked. And they, they, will be, they will govern according to the uh, way that the Egyptian people will allow them to govern. If they try to abuse their power, if they win a democratic election and they, and they rule, and they abuse their power and they try to stop the democratic process, you can be sure that people are going to go out on the streets again. If, the, if people challenge the Egyptian military, uh, they're certainly not going to be worried about challenging uh, the Muslim brothers. So there's no question about that the rules of the game have changed. And this is what's so critically important. Okay. The fear factor's broken. Excuse me, Dan. The fear factor is now broken. In Egypt? I think throughout, throughout most of the Arab world. Okay. I think it's also been, it's been successful. I mean, if you look at Lebanon, Hezbollah has been part of the Lebanese government for a number of years now. Uh, and it, it, the, the future is going to be mixes of Muslim brothers, Islamic groups with secular, with, it's going to be coalition style governments. I think that's fine. Uh, I think people will realize that the, that the Islamists are not going to have answers to all the social questions that people have been, have been asking. So I, I don't, I don't, I'm not so worried in, in, the, in the longer term. I'm more worried about, in some ways, about the military control uh, than about the, the Muslim Brothers, up to a point. Okay. Um, I apologize we have time for one more question. Maybe I'll just give each of you, as you respond to this question, a chance to say whatever you'd like to sum up. This has been a great discussion. I want to thank you for it. Yes, sir. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm from Saudi Arabia. I study at Suffolk University in government. Uh, my question is, uh, after losing an ally in Egypt, uh, don't you think Israel are trying to unstabilize the, the national of uh, the the national security of Egypt, since they didn't want to get into the war with the, the new government in Egypt. You're asking whether Israel wants to and stabilize the situation. Go to war with a new government. Yeah, yeah. So, they, uh, I mean, they, they lost an, a, a friend in Egypt, so they they don't want to get into the war with the new government, since like everyone I is like wanting to just war Israel and remove them from the the map as so. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd say that uh, the last thing on Prime Minister Netanyahu's mind would be war with Egypt. I mean, I think the Israelis are, are very troubled by the breakdown of their relationship with Egypt. It's lasted since 1979, since the March Camp David Accords of 79. Yeah. It's been a searing experience for the Israelis to see this partner um, disappear overnight. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it doesn't lead me to suggest that the Israelis are looking for conflict. They're looking for a relationship with whoever emerges, I think, in Cairo. That would be my sense of this, but this, this is the last question. Each of you get to answer it and say whatever you'd like in the way of summing up. Um, e Egypt's revolution isn't complete. Um, the, the military was in power. Guess who's in power today? The military. Um, SCAF still controls the country. Uh, SCAF, is very, SCAF pretty much understands that there are socioeconomic, socio-political issues their relations with the state, their relations with the Gulf, their relations with other countries that will, will, will uh, mandate uh, uh, their relationship with, with Israel as well. Uh, things aren't breaking down, maybe, not, 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 uh, maybe on the popular level, but not on the state level. So, uh, um, you know, po post, you know, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, to, to, uh, it took, what, decades for, uh, for Turkey to transform into a democracy, if you believe this is a democracy, it took decades for it to arrive at this at the situation. Egypt will not, uh, you know, will not shed the power of the military maybe in the next weeks or maybe in the next years even. It's a it's a long process. 
Yeah, well, I, I think just to answer and also just to sum up in, in, a, in, in a few seconds, I think, uh, I think what's very clear is that, is that something new has happened. I mean, this, these uprisings have changed the map. Things are going to change over the next years and decades. Uh, we don't, it's impossible to know exactly when. The second point is that there is going to be struggle. That there's nothing, it's impossible to determine what's going to be happening because it depends on the struggle. In, I think Egypt is extremely important. What goes on in Egypt, in a sense, is more important regionally than what happens in, in Tunisia, for instance, or even Libya. So Egypt and now perhaps Syria are, are going to be very, very important. Uh, I think the U.S. foreign policy, looking at it, has to, you know, as Rami suggested, there's an opportunity to, I don't think we forget everything, but I think there's an opportunity to realign, to come back into some kind of, at least middle of the, of the road area and say, okay, we support X and Y and push ahead with that, with a little bit less of this very clear divide between who they support and who they don't support. I think the U.S. can be more assertive uh, but in the meanwhile, it's losing more and more credibility in the region, and, and that, that's, you know, that's important. Yeah. I think that we're right now facing uh, a new Arab world, and it's not something that's, I think in a month's time, it's going to be different from where we are right now, and in two months' time, three months' time, six months' time, it's going to be in a different place than we are now. But uh, given that we're facing a new Arab world, I think that uh, what we're going to have to look at and focus on is on the internal domestic issues and no longer hold the external issues hostage. In other words, uh, for all of these years, all of these decades, these Arab countries have uh, maintained external stability at the expense of internal reform, at the expense of internal public opinion. And I think that now it's going to be a question of focusing on the internal and, and less so on the external. When it comes to Egypt and, uh, and Israel, I think that this is a lesson that Israel is going to now have to walk away with and, and learn, which is that it cannot continue. It, it's a, it's a sort of freedom, its status in the Middle East is no longer going to be the same. And instead, they're going to have to start taking into consideration public opinion across the Arab world and really recognize that they cannot continue to operate in the way that they've operated over the course of the past 60 plus years. Um, it's now, we're now in a new Middle East and it's time for Israel and the United States to take a approach. Okay. One of the slogans of the uh, Egyptian uprising is um, I think they must be, raise your, hold your head up high, you're an Egyptian. The element of pride that has now come into play in Arab politics and diplomacy is really, really important and is very hard to quantify. I know political scientists and people like that here like to quantify these things. That's why I never continued my political science studies because I couldn't understand any of that stuff. But, <laughs> but the, 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 the element, the intangible element of pride is, is the flip side of the indignity that people suffered. They have pride now. They've manifested it in several ways. And two big things now you see going on vis-a-vis -vis Israel. The Egyptians now, well, you see it three ways with the Turks as well, but in the Arab world, the Egyptians standing up to the Israelis, not wanting to make a war. They want to keep the peace treaty, but they won't put up with any kind of you know, being dissed by the Israelis, being insulted, being taken for granted. So at the political, the government level, at the popular level, you're seeing this very important new element of standing up and, 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 and demanding your rights and not being pushed around. The second uh, more important one, I think, is what the Palestinians just did with those two great merchants of dishonesty, Dennis Ross and Tony Blair, who were sent to us again last week as a great uh, a phenomenal insult when they send us these two merchants of dishonesty to try to work out a deal. And to their credit, the Palestinian leadership basically told them, go home. You're not coming with an honest deal. Go home. We won't put up with this nonsense anymore. And the Palestinians are going to the United Nations. Those are just two examples. There's many others. Uh, but this is a new uh, attitude in the hearts and minds of people which is starting to be translated into policies on the ground. It's a very constructive foundation on which to build if people will respond to it. And what it's calling for is simply the equitable application of the rule of law across the board for Arabs and Israelis and Turks and Iranians and Americans and Micronesians, that everybody should be treated the same way. And this is an amazing opportunity if people would, would see it like that and, and act on it in a constructive way. I wish we could continue this conversation. I want to thank Sultan al Qasimi, uh, Karim Akdizi, Diana Butu, and our friend Rami Hurry for their analysis. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you.